The excellent Neil Roundtree goes to New Zealand to find out how the world's deer industry really got going. Game chef Kai Atbrin's cooking up a slice of venison heart. We've got news, we've got hunting YouTube, and we've got a sobbing video editor. Find out more in this week's show. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Over the last few years, we've learned a great deal about red deer in their natural habitat, filming on the Ardna Merkin Peninsula on the west coast of Scotland. This is where Neil Rowantree manages them, hunts them and studies them. So what happens when, 150 years ago, you ship deer from Scotland to the other side of the world, to a landscape which has echoes of Scotland but is definitely not Scotland. New Zealand is a country without major predators, without any homegrown mammals to speak of at all, and a climate that optimises growth. This is a celebration of those deer and a global success story. Before we start on this red deer journey, we need to hear about the human journey. So. Let's begin in Scotland. I was always curious as to how it felt for people who were forcefully wrenched from this. Neil has brought us to a ransacked village on the Ardnamurkin estate. We know that right up to the 1830s, this was, a, it was a, a village that had a population in it where people made a living from the land. And unfortunately, a number of things occurred in the Highlands which brought about significant change. It was cleared in 1828 by the local laird to make way for a more efficient way of farming. The crops were torn up, the livestock killed, the houses destroyed and the people thrown to all corners of the globe. If you try and picture in your mind's eye being wrenched from a settlement like this against your will, packed onto a sailing ship, and the last thing you see of your home as you sail around that point. So for me, going to, uh, to New Zealand is going to be an, an incredible adventure, but it's also going to be a people story. I, I want to know what happened to uh, Highland people when they left here. They spent six months at sea and ended up in a new land that uh, they had to shape as their own. And I, and I think for me that the thing I want to investigate is to what extent the arrival of red deer in New Zealand and, and how they went from being a, almost a, a new sporting playground for the wealthy to an environmental challenge to something now that the New Zealand people we're going to meet who are Highlanders by descent have turned into a world-class product. There's a, a connection between people and deer that I want to investigate, that I want to follow but also to see what we can learn there and bring back home and maybe adapt so that we can make wiser use of our resources so that we don't have to see things like this again where people became dispossessed. So anyway, an, an interesting journey lies ahead. We're about to leave the Morven Hills behind us and travel several thousand miles to end up back in the Morven Hills again and to see how Red Deer fared on that incredible journey. Scottish red deer were soon to follow the Scottish settlers to New Zealand. It was a land where the Scots could still be Scots. Here they could still play the pipes, wear clan tartan, and now hunt red deer. Our hosts on New Zealand's South Island are the Fraser family. Brothers Duncan and Hamish, with their father Andrew, run two successful red deer operations that work hand in glove. There's the farm. It is a large-scale venison producer for the European, North American and Asian markets. 
It also sells antler velvet. Harvesting the live tissue is banned in the UK, but as Neil will learn, venison and velvet products power the hunting side of the business, and as most hunters will know, New Zealand is the land of the giants. And it's not just the stags. So this is just the, uh, the perfect example of what uh, good genetics and good feeding does from, uh, from, from what's historically come from <laughs> well, Scotland. Well, <laughs> I'm still at the right height to headbutt you. you know? <laughs> I always have been quite conscious of where the families come from and what the background is. I've never really researched it and you know it's not something you, you first think about when you get up in the morning but I mean the fact that my name is uh, very Scottish, the fact I play the bagpipes, um, I'd still say probably the city that I've enjoyed visiting the most in the world would be Edinburgh and the country that I've really enjoyed spending time in the most was going to visit Neil um, out at Art American. So um, I think there is a sense of belonging when you go back to, back to those roots. Um, but sort of just how you describe that, it's uh, not that easy. It will make it grow bigger to a certain point. Yeah. But that's like me, you know, my father's... Younger brother Duncan runs the Venatal Cardrona Safaris operation. One of their lodges is in Wanaka on the southern part of the South Island, which is where we will be based for part of our stay. Neil has been invited to shoot a stag in the surrounding terrain and a tar bull further up country. The tar is another imported game species that has flourished here. Duncan and Hamish have worked hard to promote Venator Cardrona and it now attracts clients from all over the world because they have the biggest red stags in the world. A few examples line the entrance to the lodge. We'll learn more about the development of these heads in the next episode of Planet Deer. For now, Neil wants to get a sense of what happened to the Scottish Reds after being released into the wild. In a nutshell, they boomed. When they reached epidemic proportions, they were shot and left on the hill in return for a bounty. However, one man saw a business opportunity. That man was Sir Tim Wallace. To Neil's surprise, there's a whole section of a local museum dedicated to the evolution of the New Zealand red deer industry and the captain of that industry. This whole section here is devoted to the efforts and the, the inspiration of Sir Tim Wallace, who for anybody that's keen in red deer and particularly has any knowledge of what happened in New Zealand, would realise that uh, Sir Tim and what he developed as a business had huge influence on the management of red deer, the development of deer related products and uh, basically New Zealand venison as a brand around the world. So from a very early start where they put a few carcasses to New York, they, they developed a massive industry that uh, shaped deer for future years. So uh, it was exceptional what they achieved here and, and it led eventually to Sir Tim being uh, knighted for services to the deer industry, development of deer farming and for being an entrepreneur. A year ago we were talking about deer products, you and I stood in a, a, a chill on the west coast of Scotland and, and looked at deer puzzles uh, uh, and sinews and here we are here on the dis display today looking at the final products that these eventually became part of that actually fed into what we do in Scotland today as well because they opened up and created the markets that a lot of our byproducts go into to this very day. So I think having looked at the images on display and the information that's available it's only fitting now and we've been fortunate enough that we're going to actually go and speak to one of the Wallace family and Jonathan has agreed to give us a bit of his time and he's a busy man but he's going to basically talk us through how this all happened, how it was developed and where it's taken them to today. We find Jonathan Wallace across the way at a very busy airfield. Tourists pay big bucks to see New Zealand from the air. Some hunters choose the same route, dropped off in remote areas for a hunt of a lifetime. It's a sensible way to travel and all this started thanks to Sir Tim's vision. Jonathan, thank you for taking time to speak to us here today. What I'd love is if you've got five minutes just to explain to us how, how it all came about. Yeah, uh, actually my father, who uh, is 80 this year, he was one of the pioneers of the industry. So all mammals in New Zealand were introduced essentially, except for a fur seal and a native bat. By introducing red deer and, and various goats and rabbits and things, there were no natural predators to control those animals. By the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the populations were extreme and we were getting a lot of erosion in the mountains, um, degradation of our, of our native forests. 
And so the government post the Second World War introduced um, culling programs and they would, they would employ uh, ground hunters to, to, to shoot animals, um, paid a bounty on their tails, um, and in later years they would collect their skins. But my father, he saw this as a, a, as a real waste, that they were leaving these animals on the hill. And so in April 1963, they, they hired a helicopter that was surplus to the, the Korean War and they had a group of ground shooters move through a valley and push these animals up into a big basin. In the end, they recovered um, uh, almost 200 deer. And what it showed at the end, there was a market for it. He gradually built up a fleet of helicopters. So it wasn't unusual for a helicopter and a team to shoot and recover 100 deer a day per helicopter and it peaked at around 70,000 carcasses that were exported. The commercial extraction of deer eventually peaked and then dropped in the 1970s as the number of wild deer fell. This led to a further innovation. Sir Tim developed live capture of reds for farming. And it's interesting for them as a business that, the, the, that Sir Tim, his father, developed the whole thing right the way through from uh, deer just being left lying in glens right the way through to using velvet, to using pizzles, to using bone, to using blood products, and to actually creating a market of venison export that very quickly became sort of, you, you could say, a, the, the leader in the world. And, and as a kid, I can remember people talking about New Zealand venison. And when we aren't in New Zealand, people talk about the threat of New Zealand venison. And it's interesting to see it here, when they talk with pride about developing a product. And, and it's been really interesting through the sport hunting, right through to the discussions we've had on control and culling of, of what was really a non-native species. And now it's going to be interesting now to see how it developed further into deer farming. The sight of deer carcasses being carried underneath choppers is not one that everyone likes. Certainly in the UK, Neil had first-hand experience of this in Scotland and the resulting PR fallout. Because a lot of our viewers are UK-based, helicopters and deer have always been a very uh, contentious subject. And I think at the outset, my own opinion I'd like to make is that helicopters are, are a very useful and practical vehicle for managing wildlife. And because they're so manoeuvrable, they can go into all sorts of terrain that other things can't. And, it, and the thing about helicopters, it's the ethics of how you use them. It's not really the vehicle itself, it's a vehicle like any other. And to transport deer from remote areas or people into remote areas, they take an awful lot of beating. And I think uh, what we'll see here and what's developing as we do this story in New Zealand is how important the, the helicopter was in uh, developing not only deer control, but also in developing uh, deer management and deer farming. And I, I think it's been an important part of the journey and an important connection to make. The simple fact is that if you need to shift large numbers of a perishable commodity from tough terrain to market, you need to use a helicopter. We leave the airfield for a little bit of retail therapy. And a beer. Our last stop of the day is a pub, not just any pub. I wanted to go there because it had been the, the home of the Ludgate meat packers, which is where, uh, when the deer had first started coming off the mountains in any volume in New Zealand, this was one of the places they were being processed and handled. And uh, the last time I walked into a bar like that was in the, the middle of Sutherland at a place called the Gar Vault. And it, yeah, it was like stepping back in time. And I think the thing that fascinated us was that uh, the bar itself is a celebration of what went on there. I mean, the walls are adorned with pictures of deer control activities and, and handling deer and people culling deer and helicopters in action. And everybody coming and going from the bar just saw that as commonplace. And, and that's come out through this whole journey. A, a very large percentage of New Zealand people hunt or fish. Therefore, culturally, the, the disconnect between urban and rural doesn't really seem to exist to the same extent here as it does at home. And uh, if governments in the UK, and particularly north of the border, are keen to get uh, the community more involved in the management of natural resources, there are lessons to be taken from New Zealand. And what's interesting here is that in Scotland, they look for a huge change in how they influence private land ownership. 
whereas uh, New Zealand has pioneered the use of natural resources on public land, where the man on the street can go and hunt in government blocks uh, at the rower and fill his freezer for the year. And uh, that can be venison or it can be tar. So we've still got to really question why at home we spend millions of pounds shooting deer when we could develop something similar to what they have in New Zealand where the man on the street gets an opportunity to go and manage uh, a natural resource in his native land. Next time on Planet Deer, Neil hunts tar and learns why New Zealanders lead the world in farming red deer. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, the Frasers. It's fascinating what an influence deer are. And that film is dedicated to the memory of Matthew Wallace, son of Sir Tim and brother of Jonathan, whom we interviewed in that film uh, last month. Matthew was killed in what's been described as a routine helicopter flight. Our thoughts are with the Wallace family. Uh, now from New Zealand to Sweden, of all places, where uh, David is filming with Roy Lupton at the moment and just had time to read this week's Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Hunt saboteurs wearing balaclavas tried to disrupt a grouse shoot in the Yorkshire Dales at the weekend. Police were called after around 60 saboteurs, half of them in black balaclavas, gathered in the centre of Reith and followed a shooting party onto the Swaledale Moors. Dale Sport, which runs shoots, said the saboteurs tried to stone shoot vehicles and intimidate shoot staff. The sabs also accidentally disrupted a family fun day for guide dogs that was taking place at the same time. The antis are also up to their old tricks, inciting violence and pretending not to. The Stop the Cull Facebook group says it is publishing the names, phone numbers and addresses of people involved with the Autumn Badger Cull in the UK. It's urging activists to call them to ask why they want to kill badgers. Even farmers outside cull areas say they've been receiving death threats from antis. The bird shooting season has opened in Jamaica, but with a difference. This year, the National Environment and Planning Agency has asked bird shooters to shoot white-tailed deer on site as well. The deer are an invasive species on the island and the government is so keen to get rid of the thousands of animals now living there, it's happy for hunters with shotguns to do the job, plus gather data on the animal's range. Bird hunting on Jamaica runs from the 18th of August to the 23rd of September. South Africa has put leopard back on the quarry list. The South African Department of Environmental Affairs has reinstated leopard hunting after a three-year moratorium. It's allowing two tags for five tom leopards in Limpopo and two toms in KwaZulu-Natal. The leopards to be hunted must be seven years or older. Hunters in one American state will soon be able to be pretty in pink as well as blaze orange. Here is State Governor Bruce Rauner announcing that he has signed the blaze pink bill into law and claiming it's all about safety, not fashion. Uh, the law has been blaze orange is what we wear to see each other. But the reality is in the fall, when we're hunting in trees um, and often in some fields, there is orange leaves. There's orange in the background. So it does not always stand out to see orange. So we're adding blaze pink, blaze pink to be one of the colors. You can see that very easily everywhere from a long, long distance. You can see it a long way off. Staying in the US and the alligator hunting season has seen some big animals landed. A Florida-based outfit pulled in a giant 12-foot, 360-pound alligator during the state's first day of alligator hunting. Meanwhile, the Alabama Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries Division has shared photographs from this year's hunt on its Facebook page. There's still nothing as big as the 1,000-pound, 15-foot alligator caught by a woman in Alabama in 2014. There's a new shooting shop in Staffordshire. Charlie snipped the ribbon at Bailey's Shooting and Country Wear in Hensford, Staffordshire, on the edge of Cannock Chase at the weekend. Run by John Bailey, Bailey's is an online shop and this is its first town centre store. Visit baileyshooting.co.uk. And finally, an animal activist who was visiting the bird fair last week put out a surprisingly racist tweet. Unless he has something against black binoculars, we think he means ethically, not ethnically. He has since deleted the tweet. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts.
Thank you, David. In last week's show, Kayat Brin was out stalking fallow deer and he promised us a recipe off the back of that. Well, here it is. It is venison heart wraps. There you are, hand over one of those, and you really can say, have a heart. Now, would you like to win a shirt like the one Kai is wearing? It's a Blazer Poplin classic shirt, priced at £89. And we're giving away one shirt somewhere in the region of small to 2XL. Uh, you can click on a link in the description to find out more about the shirt. All you have to do is write Blaza Poplin Classic Shirt in the comments section below this film, either on YouTube or on its page on Facebook, and we will pick a winner in a few weeks' time. Later in the show, we have a cartoon treat for you. Next up, we have our roundup of the best hunting and shooting videos on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. <laughs> This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Dean Lloyd of Lloydies Outdoors in Australia sends me a film he put up in May. Easter 2018 was good to him this year with 120 foxes, four pigs and a handful of rabbits. We covered their deer in this week's show. Here is one of New Zealand's other pest species hunting assets. Clark Boys Hunting NZ are out after feral pigs with two dogs and a rifle. On the other side of the world, Joe Vargan in Norway is walking up grouse. Just uploaded this film dates from 2017 and he says we'll inspire him to greater efforts this season. Now it is the week of the long deer film on YouTube this week. Rose Stalker calls in and takes a malformed roebuck during a thunderstorm in this film. Another old friend of Field Sports Channel, Lukas Mikalev from Malta, is hunting in Hungary, trying out the Leica Geovid HDB. He shoots lots of animals and, perhaps for reasons of taste, we see nothing fall over. Serval Channel is after roebuck during the rut in Croatia, lots of dreamy shots of deer frolicking in what you might call evening harvest scapes. More from Eastern Europe, Norbert Simon is out after roebucks in Romania in this film, which he has also posted on the Wilt Jäger channel. And finally, the German hunting magazine Deutsche Jagd Zeitung provides a lovely deer hunting estate profile at Lütersberg Castle in Ostfriesland, which you might think sounds a bit boring, but it is on the North Sea Bang opposite Yorkshire, and I think it's fascinating the similarities and differences between the two places. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Now, here is a little bit of self-indulgence to end on. You probably take for granted all the titles and logos we put into the show. Well, they all have to come from somewhere, like the title and logo for Neil's new series, Planet Deer. Here is a short film from our editor, Aaron Jones, that I can only describe as a cry for help. So, I was given a task by one of my clients, Field Sports Channel, to have a creative think about a title and some graphics for their latest YouTube series. It's a series all about deer all around the world and the stories about how they got there as some of them were imported into countries like New Zealand, how they affected the environments and how they're looked after and how they're managed. And most of all, why they are so important to communities, landscapes and economies. Field Sports Channel thought that a good name for the series was Planet Deer, which was a great place to start, definitely. 
So let's make a start. Uh, right, creative process. Here we go. Uh, so a planet and a deer. Okay. Um, oh, how about uh, a planet and some antlers? Yeah, it could work. Uh, some antlers and a planet. Maybe a deer. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, dear. Oh, hi, dear. Dear puns. No idea. No dear. For real, though. Dear and loathing in Las Vegas. Cape dear. Dear pool. Dear hard. Jurassic dear. Wait, what? Yeah. Aunt Kangaroo's just T Rex dear. Jaws. What? Dear fiction. Now you're just putting antlers on posters. John dear. Okay, that one was quite funny, but stop. Ta dear. Planet dear. What do you think? You'll be able to watch it on Field Sports Channel on YouTube next Wednesday, I guess, at uh, 7 pm dumped. Until next time, stay creative, guys. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Most amusing. Now, if you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can join the merry throng of angels and dragons who are backing us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares and find out more there. It only remains for me to say good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.